Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. So, last night I got a private message on Discord from Pointy Haired Jedi, one of the World of Warships community contributors. He'd just finished a random battle in his British Tier 6 destroyer, HMS Icarus, and he thought to himself, you know, I'll bet Jingles would enjoy this, and, well, he wasn't wrong. And hopefully, you lot are going to enjoy it too. So, HMS Icarus. Most people don't really think that the British destroyer line gets good until tier 8, with the, I believe it's the Lightning. I acknowledge that the Icarus isn't a fantastically good ship, but it's not bad. It's the first British destroyer that can stealth torpedo, although only just, and you do need a 10 point captain with a concealment expert skill. But if you satisfy those requirements, you get a 1km window of opportunity to get your 7km range torpedoes away before you sail to within 6km of an enemy ship and they see you. Ideally, you're going to want to be making the maximum possible effective use of your torpedoes. Not just because for the first time you can actually stealth torpedo with the Icarus, but also because you get so many of them. The Icarus has two torpedo launchers, both of which have five torpedo tubes, for a grand total of ten torpedoes. And of course, because this is a British destroyer, there's no widespread. Well, there technically is. But the widespread on this thing is what would be a narrow spread on anybody else. And your narrow spread is single fire. Now, the single fire is best really only used against battleships that are sailing in straight lines or completely stationary in a mobile targets. Under most circumstances, you're probably going to be better off actually firing the narrow spread which on the Icarus, of course, is the widespread. This has the potential to get very complicated and very confusing very quickly, but trust me, it does make sense. Now, while the guns on the Icarus aren't great, when you do have to use the guns, you're at least in a better situation than you would be if you were, for example, in an equivalent tier Japanese destroyer. The high explosive shells are actually pretty good on this thing. They do hit very hard. The armor piercing shells are absolutely rubbish and should only be used where absolutely necessary. The rate of fire is pretty good with the guns reloading every 5 seconds, but it only has 4 of them. And the turret traverse is kind of slow as well, taking 18 seconds for the guns to rotate 180 degrees. So, better than a Japanese destroyer of the same tier, but not as good as an American, Russian or even German destroyer of the same tier. On the other hand, you do have a lot of pretty good torpedoes, which certainly puts you ahead of the Americans and the Russians, if not the Germans or the Japanese. Right now, Pointy Hair Jedi has just finished capping Alpha, and from the relative safety of his short duration smokescreen, he's taken that enemy battleship under fire. The team are already down one cruiser, and they're probably about to lose another, as that Omaha up ahead has just, yep, there he goes, <laughs> just YOLO'd right into the middle of the cap circle, and then turned broadside on in front of a whole bunch of enemy ships suffering pretty much the exact same fate as any other tier 5 cruiser that isn't the fur attacker that pulls that kind of move because unlike the fur attacker they're all made out of citadels gasoline and matches the two dead cruisers are immediately joined by the ochotnik the tier 5 premium soviet destroyer who's been found and sunk by the enemy shinonomi and with the team now not far from 300 points behind it would be really nice if somebody can actually sink something the friendly Kamikaze R is having a damn good try, as he's launched some torpedoes over there against that Prinz Eitel Friedrich, the technically new German Tier 6 premium battleship, although more accurately it's a Mackinson class battle cruiser. Pointy Haired Jedi decides that he may as well join this party since the Prinz Eitel Friedrich is inside the 7km torpedo range and dumps all 10 of his torpedoes in the water as well. But the Prince Eitel Friedrich looks like he's manoeuvring to avoid torpedoes fired by the Kamikaze R, so in an attempt to grab his attention and make him turn the right way, he starts shooting at him. Of course the torpedoes are a much bigger threat, and the Prince Eitel Friedrich does manage to avoid all but one of Pointy Head Jedi's torpedoes. And while it scores damage, the German battleship's damage control was probably still up from the Kamikaze R's torpedo hits, and so there's no flooding which is a shame because that would have been a permanent flood. Then again, he probably wouldn't have gotten a huge amount of damage out of it because the Kamikaze R's second torpedo salvo is already on the way, hits, pointy hair Jedi, sets a fire, and it's the fire that actually claims the Tier 6 German battleship. 
little bit of the kill steal. <laughs> but it's not like he wasn't trying to sink the guy. So we'll let him get away with that one. Meanwhile, T-22, German Tier 5 destroyer. The thing about these British smoke screens is while you do get a lot of them, they don't last. So you can't really hide in smoke screens the way other destroyers can, particularly the Americans with their long-lasting smoke screens, and just farm damage on ships that have been spotted by the rest of your team. Now compared to the Icarus, that T-22 over there has the same number of guns in faster rotating turrets with a one second faster reload. But they don't do nearly as much damage with the high explosive shells. And to do any kind of damage whatsoever, they have to actually hit the target. And so far none of them have. Pointy Hair Jedi, on the other hand, has been scoring regular hits with every salvo that he's fired. Even the ones where he can't actually see the target. The T-22, recognising that there's a very good chance he's going to lose this fight, has dumped his smokescreen. But he's still moving way too fast to stay permanently hidden inside it. And in fact, the only thing that really saves him here is that the course that Pointy Head Jedi has sailed has actually taken him out of line of sight of the T-22. So the T-22 lives to fight on another day. Which is kind of bad news. Because while Pointy Head Jedi's team have pulled a couple of kills back, they're still way behind on points and they no longer hold any of the capture circles. Looks like Jedi is going for that T-22. And... There he is. Oh, unfortunately this guy zigged when he should have zagged. He's heading left when he probably should have stayed behind the smoke screen and headed right. Then he wouldn't have been air spotted by those torpedo bombers. He would have been able to stay inside the cap circle and pointy head Jedi wouldn't have been able to kill him. So luckily he did turn left rather than right, which means pointy head Jedi has gotten his second kill and he's successfully defended capture point A, which at the moment is the only capture point that his team currently holds. Although it looks like somebody is doing their level best to attempt to flip Charlie and take control of it from the enemy team as well. So, with the capture point successfully defended and with his second kill secured, right now Pointy Head Jedi is thinking, where do I need to go? Right now it's kind of tempting to go after those two Dallas class cruisers, but there are a couple of factors that influence his decision not to. For a start, the captain of the Dallas to the rear is firing shells with blue tracers, so that means he has Alexander Oveshkin as the commander of his ship, which means he has at least a 10 point captain and has completed at least one of the various different campaigns in World of Warships, which is a general indication that he's probably a better than average experienced player. The more important reason why he doesn't go after the two Dallases, of course, is because going after them is going to take him away from the actual battle that's happening. And since he is in a relatively stealthy destroyer and the enemy team have two of the three capture points under control, Chasing after a pair of map border hugging cruisers probably isn't the best possible use of his time. And then of course there's the fact that those two cruisers both know that there are multiple enemy destroyers in this location, or there were, because one of them was firing at the German Tier 6 destroyer on Pointy Head Jedi's team. And in fact has just launched his catapult aircraft, which meant that going after those two destroyers would have been very difficult to approach them undetected and near impossible to be able to torpedo them undetected. And while the Icarus's guns aren't bad, you are definitely not going to win a gunfight against a pair of Dallases. So rather than spend the next couple of minutes on a wild goose chase pursuing a pair of cruisers that he's going to struggle to catch and is almost certainly not going to be able to torpedo, he instead turns around and heads to an area of the map where he's likely to be able to make himself a lot more useful. And while turning and coming in this direction was absolutely the right thing to do under the circumstances, I think it's possible that he underestimated just how dangerous a Prinzital Friedrich can be at ranges of less than 6 kilometers. Now, the secondaries on that thing are quite impressive for a Tier 6, but only for a Tier 6. They're not nearly as intimidating as, for example, the secondaries on a Bismarck, a Tirpitz, or, God forbid, a Grosser Kurfürst. But they're still pretty nasty. The problem here, of course, is not just the damage that he took from the Prince Eitel Friedrich and not just the systems that got knocked out, forcing him to use his damage control and blow his smoke screen. It's also the fact that he got spotted. And while the Prince Eitel Friedrich is a very clumsy ship and has a turning radius equivalent to several dozen football fields, he had enough warning because he saw pointy haired Jedi that he was able to avoid all but one of those torpedoes. But on the bright side, even though he didn't get the Prince Eitel Friedrich, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, those highly visible torpedoes 
which had been spotted by the German battleship, did somehow manage to impact with and sink the French Eigel destroyer four kilometres away on the other side of the Prince Eitel Friedrich. So, you know, there's that. Kill number three. Now, the team is still behind on kills and way behind on points, but the cap situation is actually looking pretty good. The enemy team still hold Charlie, but they haven't managed to recap A, and Jedi's team are in the process of flipping Bravo. As well as that, even though you can't see it happening, that Kamikaze R is once again profiting from pointy head Jedi's torpedoes, slamming his torpedoes into the broadsides of enemy ships that were turning to avoid the torpedoes fired by Jedi and he has managed to hit that Prince Eitel Friedrich, and he's flooded him, and he's going to sink very, very soon. So you might be forgiven for thinking that things are actually starting to look pretty good. And while that Prince Eitel Friedrich is doomed, have a look at the position of those two Dallas-class cruisers that slipped around to the north of the map. They've just sunk the Bajoni, and one of them is about to sink the aircraft carrier, which is practically taking the aircraft carrier out of the battle as he attempts to defend himself from both of those Dallases, and is in all likelihood actually going to take the aircraft carrier out of the battle as he dies to the two Dallases. Which means that Jedi's team are very shortly going to be down to three ships, and oh boy isn't that replay camera bad when it's tracking torpedoes. Wow, that's nasty. On the bright side, I think we're guaranteed to score at least two hits on that Normandy, and oh look, there's the enemy carrier. Now, it's at this point, and he does in fact two, maybe three? No, just the two hits scored on the Normandy, so that's good. But it's at this point where Jedi makes what's arguably his only really questionable decision during the course of this battle. He goes after the carrier. Now he's just fired his torpedo, so he's got at least a minute to wait before he can fire them again. And even if they were loaded, he's chasing the carrier, and the independence is pretty quick. And the torpedoes only have a 7km range, which means realistically, in order to guarantee a torpedo hit, he'd probably have to launch them from about 3km away. But that's all academic, because the torpedoes are not ready to go, so he's using his guns. And while the high explosive shells from these 120mm guns are pretty good, He's chasing the independents, so he can only fire two of them, and they're not that good. And of course, all the time he's doing this, he's spotted, and he's coming under continuous air attack. Now, it's easy for me to sit here, in retrospect, saying, mm, well, yes, he should have done this, he should have done that. And while this is, in my opinion, at least a mistake, he would have been far better off remaining undetected, by all means, keep the aircraft carrier spotted, but pursue the damage Normandy, and assist the Kamikaze R in sinking him. And then you have all the time in the world to finish off the carrier. Then again, if he had done that, you probably wouldn't be seeing this replay because the ending wouldn't have been quite as hilarious. So, questionable decision or not, and you could argue that it isn't. I mean, I think it probably is, but hey, what do I know? This is the decision that he made, and it's because he made this decision that you're watching this video today. Now, before we get too carried away, while he's trying to set that carrier on fire, more dramatic events have just transpired to the north. The surviving Dallas, after successfully killing the friendly carrier, manages to ram and take out both himself and the New Mexico. And the Kamikaze R does manage to successfully flood and sink the Normandy, but not before the Normandy was able to get a final gun salvo away and sink the Kamikaze R. Something that probably would not have happened if Jedi had left this carrier alone and had assisted the Kamikaze R against the Normandy. But he didn't. And because he didn't, he is now the last player left alive on his team. The Independents managed to not get set on fire and also break a line of sight and is now, for the moment at least, safe on the other side of that island. And just about the only good news here, as far as Jedi is concerned, is that rather than keep him spotted, the enemy carrier is instead choosing to recover and recycle his aircraft, so for the moment at least, he's undetected. Something that the enemy Shinonomi is probably very upset about. Because while he doesn't exactly know where Jedi is, and Jedi doesn't know exactly where he is, he's got a fairly good idea because somebody, and it's not the Independents, is flipping Capture Point Bravo. So, torpedoes away. 
bit of a Hail Mary here. He has no idea of the precise location of the Shinonomi. And unfortunately, the Shinonomi now knows exactly where he is because Jedi is spotted by enemy fighters. And the Shinonomi immediately starts shooting. Now, you might think that this is suicidal, but, well, the Shinonomi's guns are not bad. It's got more of them, and they're higher calibre, and they do a lot more damage. Although, once again, it's Jedi shooting, rather than the actual calibre, rate of fire and damage output of the guns that proves temporarily decisive. Jedi is running his short duration Hydro. The thing about the British Destroyer Hydro is that it lasts a very long time, but it has a very short range, so it's only really effective for giving you advance warning of torpedoes. Now, you can, of course, tell where airdropped torpedoes are going to be coming from. You just follow the location of the aircraft. It's not the airdropped torpedoes, however, that he's concerned about. It's the ones that the Shenanomi has almost certainly, yep, there they are, fight through the gap between those two islands. It's also amusing to note, or at least it was very amusing to me, that the Shinonomi did not capture Bravo. He was in such a rush to get over here and sink Jedi. Although he's managed to fail to hit Jedi on multiple occasions, despite the fact that Jedi has come under attack both from the carrier and the enemy destroyer, and he's coming under attack from them while he's in the middle of Capture Point Charlie. So he's actually flipping Charlie as well. What's equally amusing, at least to me, is that despite on paper having comparable gun power to an Icarus and having started the gunfight with double Jedi's hit points, the Shinonomi is so far, well, losing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh, there he is. Why is he not shooting? Is he launching torpedoes? Jedi's sonar is still running. He's never going to sink him with torpedoes while that's up. No, he is shooting. Now, he's activated his engine boost. You can tell by the thick black smoke coming out of his funnels. But Jedi's last salvo knocked his engine out, and yet he is still coming to a stop, which means this guy doesn't have last stand. <laughs> OK, he finally hit Jedi. But it's a case of too little too late, because Jedi has already flipped the capture point. Of course, if he could hit Jedi again, he'd probably kill him, and that would do. Although, technically speaking, it might take two more salvos, but so far this guy's gunnery has left a lot to be desired. Now, this isn't going to be easy for Jedi. I mean, he's getting shot at by an equivalent tier destroyer while at the same time, and getting hit by an equivalent tier destroyer, about damn time. But at the same time, he's having to dodge dive bombers and torpedo bombers. Might be time to use your smokescreen, Jedi just to give yourself a bit of breathing space. Because if that Shinonomi gets another good hit on you, and luckily that wasn't a good hit, although it did knock out a gun turret, he's dead. He's now with less than a thousand health. Now the team are advising him to run and just stay alive and win on points. If it wasn't for the aircraft carrier still alive, that would actually be a good idea. He could just turn around within the smoke screen, keeping it between him and the Shinonomi, and run. They both have the same speed. That might work but the carrier is just going to keep him spotted. So he has to fight this guy. And luckily for Jedi, for some bizarre reason, the Shinonomi has turned around. And while on paper the Shinonomi's guns are the equal of the Icarus's guns, the Icarus has them beaten one vital respect. Turret rotation speed. Those things take 30 seconds to turn around. They were all pointing in the right direction, but now they're not. And that's what killed him. And with the Shinonomi disposed of, now all Jedi has to do to win is stay alive. And if he'd been in anything other than a British destroyer, that probably wouldn't have happened. Because he's under air attack again. And it's only going to take one dive bomber hit to finish him off. But as well as the long duration and short ranged hydro, and the ability to single fire torpedoes, British destroyers also have one other defining characteristic. See, he's not going to be able to sink the independence. But the smoke screens, while they don't last very long, they have a very, very short cooldown. And if he'd been in a destroyer of any other nation, there is absolutely no way his smoke screen would have been up again so quickly. And so while the torpedoes missed him, the dive bombers probably wouldn't have, and he would almost certainly have died at the last second. But, well, he was in a British destroyer, so he didn't. <laughs> And I think that's fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, pointy head Jedi, doing it the hard way and winning that one by the skin of his teeth. Uh, thank you so much for sending that one in. 
it definitely entertained me and hopefully it entertained you lot as well. If you want to see more like this, or if you want to submit your own replays, because Pointy Head Jedi also features subscriber replays, then link down below in the video description of both his Twitch and his YouTube channels. In the meantime, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.